This con this conference will now be recorded. Good morning and welcome to OGR's Roundtable, Five Things You Must Do Now for Your Business to Survive COVID-19. I have Dan Azard with me on the line and he's going to be sharing. Um, this is a 30-minute roundtable, so we'll have about 15 minutes for him to share and then 15 minutes for you to ask questions. There is a handout that we emailed you this morning that accompanies today's talk. If you did not receive it, please send me a chat and I will make sure you get that um, either during today's session or immediately afterward. If you wouldn't mind putting yourself on mute and making sure your camera is turned off, you'll be able to unmute yourself once it's time for questions. But for the first part of this, we just ask that everybody be muted except for Dan. And Dan, if you wanna take it away. Excellent. Good morning, Jessica. Can uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Fabulous. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, these are the most difficult times any of us have faced. Uh, we're worried about our health. We're worried about ser serving families. We're worried about protecting employees. And we're worried about our businesses surviving. To that end, I don't want to talk today about serving families. I know you're going to figure it out and you're going to do the best job you can, but I do want to talk about the absolutely critical steps you must make in order to keep your business healthy. Your business is the golden goose. Assuming that you survived with your life, you need your business to provide an income as it did a month ago going forward in the future. So to that, as Jessica and Nancy and I strategized about five or six days ago, what this presentation should be addressed as, we talked about the five steps, but we also talked about being fluid. Today, I don't have five steps. If you count them up, in, in my handout, you probably have about 60 steps. So with that, let me begin. <clears throat> Number one, cash is king. Cash. I don't mean equity, I mean cash. You must do everything in your power to maintain cash. This is a Midas reaction. And there is nothing short of having all the cash that you think is necessary and then some. Certainly, we have no responsibility for filing income taxes until July, but at the same time, we have no responsibility for filing the tax payments until July. Keep that cash under your control. In the event you're accustomed to filing uh, estimated taxes, keep that cash under your control. Again, no responsibility until July 15th. It's going to sound cruel, but do not pay any bills except the most essential. See, one of the things is, again, you have to have cash. Cash is the only thing that will keep you employing people because we don't know how insurance companies are going to be paying into the future. We don't know how families are going to be paying into the future. You need cash to sustain yourself. In case you're worried that you're going to have a bad credit rating by being slow pay on some uh, bills, ladies and gentlemen, the world is different today. Credit ratings are a curve. They're graded on a curve. If you uh, have only slow paid five and somebody else has slow paid 10 vendors, you're going to have a much better credit rating. Credit ratings are going to be re underwritten, re understood when, assuming if, you survive this calamity. The SBA and the federal government have put together several points of relief. I'm going to address those in a few minutes. And they are, again, absolutely critical for you to take advantage of. If you find that you don't need the money, great. Better to pay it back in June, July, or next May than not to have it now. 
any lenders that you have that are not government underwritten, they're maybe conventional lenders, you must call them and talk to them and find out what abatements they're going to allow you to take advantage of. Not because you can't pay, but because you shouldn't pay. Because any payments to a bank or a financial institution is less money that you have in cash to provide for your business and your staff. <clears throat> know where you can get cash if you need it. Let's assume you have a line of credit. Right now, draw it down 100%. Put the money in a bank account, but draw it down because there's nothing that says that line of credit might not evaporate. We don't know. But cash is king. When it looks at, when you look at your overhead of operations, again, look at the essential points of operating your business and the non-essential. Item two, lead your staff by serving your staff. Your staff has to know that they're safe. If you've already started cutting people, it's premature. It was a knee-jerk reaction. If you have cash and if you have the cash flow from that cash, now you have options. In fact, some of the loans are even contingent upon you're maintaining your staff. You will find that some loans that I'll talk about in a moment will in fact be forgiven. That's right, forgiven to the degree you keep your people employed. The federal government understands they can't pump out enough relief quick enough for unemployment that's skyrocketing. So if you can keep people employed, they would rather use that money and reimburse you so that way people stay employed. Uh, almost 70 million people have gone unemployed or will be unemployed within 30 days. That is tumultuous in a household. Let me talk about the federal stimuli and loans and loan packages. I'm going to talk about three different avenues that have been put in place over the last 20 days. There are more than this. We're still learning about some of the little things that have been put into the stimuli package. But number one, the CARES Act, C-A-R-E-S. This provides that if you have an SBA underwritten loan, that the federal government will make your payments for the next six months. The federal government will make your payments for the next six months. This is not a loan from the federal government. This is them making those payments. So what do you do? You take the cash that you would have paid and you keep it in the bank. If you don't have an SBA loan, then go to that lender. There are certain provisions for mortgage relief, for rent relief, but the SBA loans are powerful. And in the event you're trying to buy another business or you're in the point of refinancing debt or taking out a new SBA loan, the SBA is still funding loans. Paragraph number two on the small business loan packages is the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP. Basically, this is a program that is intended to help keep your employees employed. It's meant to help you pay wages and salaries, health insurance, retirement benefit contributions, company paid employment taxes, and there are provisions for rent 
mortgage utilities, and any other debt obligations, even non-SBA debt. In order to do this, you have to make an application, whereas the uh, SBA loan deferral program is automatic. You have to do nothing for that. For the PPP, you have to make an application. Now, if you thought the line at Costco was long to get toilet paper, you ain't seen nothing. The PPP is a massive program and you want to get in line as quickly as possible. If you have a lender that's an SBA lender, preferably one that is a PLP lender, PLP meaning a preferred lender program, which means they can authorize and implement loans on their own accord. They have that level of responsibility as if they're a de facto uh, version of the SBA. That is preferable. If you don't have a lender, send me an email. I will be very happy to get you the application and get you in with our clients. We have worked to get preferential treatment with one SBA lender. In the event you get the loan from the SBA for the PPP, this is going to give you money to provide for your people. And in the event you keep 75% of your people employed over the next 90 days, you're going to have that loan forgiven. Forgiven, meaning you won't owe the repayment on it. The objective is that you have to spend approximately 80% of the loan on all these items, wages, salaries, health insurance, employment, uh, retirement plan, company pay taxes, employee taxes, rent, mortgage, utilities. Any amount that you don't spend for that or in the event you do have turnover and you lay off people and you have less than 75%, the part that is not forgiven will be repaid. It's due to be repaid over a 10-year loan beginning in May of 2021, and it's approximately a 4% fixed income, I'm sorry, fixed loan interest rate. Uh, paragraph number three is the disaster relief loan. This went into effect about uh, two and a half weeks ago. <clears throat> Basically, to the degree you can demonstrate that your business has a impairment due to this disaster, you can borrow money and you can pay it back over a 30 year 3.75% loan interest rate. So it's a 30-year loan, 3.75% <clears throat> interest rate. So how are funeral homes calculating a disaster? Well, the way we would do it is we look at your historical revenue per call and then look at your revenue per call once, <coughs> excuse, me, excuse me, your state uh, started limiting gatherings. <clears throat> Let me say, for example, March 15th. The average revenue per call that we're seeing of our clients nationwide is anywhere from $1,200 per call to $2,000 per call. In fact, ironically, the only funeral homes that aren't adversely affected right now are Jewish funeral homes because they don't have visitations, and they usually don't have a service. More of their services are graveside over the last several years, except with the orthodoxy. So figure out what the difference is between your average revenue per call before the disaster and since the disaster, and then Calculate it out over the next six months. So if you're a 200-call funeral home, over the next six months, you'd probably do 100 calls. 
if your average revenue per call is down two thousand dollars that would be two thousand dollars 100 calls therefore that's two hundred thousand dollars of loss somebody's not muted or else my time is up not sure what's going on i will mute them thank you continue you're welcome uh, and don't tell us their name but just hint at it and we'll all make fun of them <laughs> uh, so you have a two hundred thousand dollar potential disaster that you should borrow now the disaster relief loan and the ppp loan are uh in conflict you probably can't qualify for both of them but uh put in the application for both of them see which gives you more and most importantly be flexible do not delay move quickly for this the lines are horrendously long now yesterday two of my clients asked me gee dan uh, i have companies uh, uh restaurants and other small businesses near me and and they're hurt much worse than i am so i'm not going to put in for a ppp loan or a disaster relief loan ladies and gentlemen understand this it is not about you versus them you can both apply you're not taking money from them you are applying for yourself your objective is to stay in business and in fact i'm not trying to say this to be a, a, a motivator but when this disaster is resolved assuming that you have your health you want your business to be stronger than it ever has been we're going to see a lot of funeral homes go out of business because of this but this was the catalyst because they had terrible cash flow uh, beforehand they had terrible cash balances beforehand and this is just going to wreck them they're going to realize that they should have sold or shut down or sold off their real estate we've gone from 22,000 funeral homes in the year 2000 to about 19,500 in 2018 you want to make a guess how many we're going to have come the end of 2021? It's not going to be more. It's going to be less. So with that, uh, to respect our timeline, uh, you have my handout. If you don't, please reach out to Jessica or Nancy, and they will send it to you in full. If you have questions, I'll take them now. If you have something personal that you want to discuss with me, uh, my contact information uh is on the handout feel free to call email whatever it takes but i urge you to focus on the future but take action immediately to get as much cash under your control as possible now that is the only way you have the best chance of surviving Thank you, Dan. If you do have a question, you can either put it into the chat box or unmute yourself at this time to directly ask him. And I know you weren't able to get through all of the steps on the handout. So if, if as you're looking through the handout, if you see um, something that strikes you that you'd like to ask him specifically about, that also works as well. Dan, this is Nancy. Um, you know, I speak to a lot of our members around the country and they express a lot of the concerns you've been discussing. But in your handout, you talk a little bit about some adjustments to their GPL right now. And I think that might be really valuable for you to um, review with everybody of your suggestions when it comes to the GPL. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. The silence was terrifying me. Uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, if you're not a client of mine, you, you may have heard me speak uh, from an OGR platform or, or just in general. But I'm a great believer that we need to be a service fee driven world. 
The merchandise world is certainly wonderful. And prior to 1985, we were a merchandise driven world, but today we are a service driven world. If in fact you understand that and you accept that, then you need to set your service fees accurately. Do not wait to come out of this. If I told you 100% of your services are going to be direct burial or direct cremation, what changes would you make to your general price list? Well, I can tell you that your basic non-declinable service fee would not only be higher, but it would be consistent. It would be the same for burial and cremation. Your removal fees, refrigeration or other basic body care and transfer to the point of interment or cremation would be higher. If you knew that you were not going to get any revenue on service fees for your facilities for visitation, you would basically charge zero for them because they're not going to generate revenue. Well, that is the world that we live in today. And without sounding too much of an alarmist, I'd say we're living in for the next 90 to 180 days. <clears throat> so when are you going to wait to change your general price list. Change it today. This is not gouging or hoarding or um, taking advantage of families. This is saying I've made a mistake in the way my prices are set and I need to correct them because otherwise I am out of business. Now, the funny thing is families will pay that. And if you continue that practice when we survive, your business will be a much healthier business post COVID. Thank you, Dan. We have a couple of questions that came in through the chat box. Um, someone is asking, is the PPP separate from an SBA loan program or do you have to have an SBA loan to qualify for the PPP? No, uh, good, good question. I'm sorry, I didn't make that clearer. The SBA loan uh, offering, the uh, where the federal government, the SBA, pays your SBA loan for the next six months is independent of filing for a PPP loan. In the event you file for a PPP loan, you do not need to have an SBA loan. These are two separate matters. It's just that the banks that represent the SBA are processing the PPP loan applications. The disaster relief loans are going directly to the uh, government. Uh, so it's a different underwriting and ultimately everything will get sorted out. Okay, thank you. Another question, how are part-time employees treated when calculating the 75% level of staffing to determining forgiveness? Our part-time staff are only used on services. So if no service, no part-time staff. Yeah, an, another good question. It, it's being looked at as I understand, and a lot of these details are not spelled out in the law. They're gonna be spelled out in the uh, follow-up points, but it's based upon your payroll payments. But I believe, and we've run this on a couple of our clients, I believe that even if, you employ no part-time people, your payroll will still keep you within that 75% range. And if it doesn't, you'll have a small loan. You'll be paying it off over a long period of time at a below, uh, very low interest rate. What the heck? It's better to have the government's money than to not have it. Okay, so if you guys still have questions, keep typing those into the chat box. It looks like Nancy has one. I, I do, because Dan, I've, I've been looking through things, obviously, at the OGR office, we've been very, very focused on how to help guide our members, which is where this um, time with you came out of. But the question I have is, as you discuss these, you know, PPP and disaster relief, is there any circumstance under which one of our members should not be applying for those things? In the, in, in the cemetery world, the expression is 
better to have and not need than to need and not have. And I think that's the mantra that we need to adopt uh, right now in funeral service. It's better to have the government's money and not need it, in which case you could pay it back than to need it and not have it. Now, I, I do want to tell the listeners, I should have mentioned it earlier, that if you go to the Foresight website, uh, www.theforesightcompanies.com, we do have a special blog page that we have put up just to deal with all of the breaking news dealing with COVID-related relief uh, and financial matters, as well as operating opinions, and uh, go up there, check it out, or register, and therefore you'll be notified every time a uh, new post is uh, is made. But it's better to have the money than not have the money. You could pay it back risk-free, interest-free. So um, who do you recommend on the staff to fill out those forms? Would it be the owner? Would it be the, you know, financial bookkeeper? With the information that they're going to ask for, do you have a recommendation as who is best um, suited to be sitting down in front of their computer with whatever time it takes to fill all of that out? Yeah, a good question. Now, keep in mind, the PPP goes through the SBA through a bank that you're using for the SBA. And that's a very short application that can be done by the owner or the bookkeeper. The disaster relief loan uh, is, is a more complicated application. The website is crashing constantly. There are somewhere around 30,000 inquiries an hour on the disaster relief website. Uh, but that uh, second site, the disaster relief loan, probably is going to be best completed by your bookkeeper. I think as we Maybe start to uh, wrap up, one of the things is, this has been a very trying time for everyone in funeral service. And I, I guess I always like to leave things on a little bit of a positive note. And um, I'm hoping maybe you have some outlooks for those funeral homes who navigate the COVID-19 pandemic well, both financially as well as within professionally, um, the way they're running their businesses. What is sort of your outlook for those who um, are successful as we come out the other side of this? Well, uh, certainly if you understand that I think cash is the number one criteria to giving you the best opportunity to come out through the other side, understand that this is a time that is almost Darwinian uh, in, in, in theory. The, the ill-prepared will not survive. Now, I, I can tell you that uh, while we don't espouse this position too loud too often, uh, we, we do believe that in the United States, there are too many funeral homes. To be in a town of 10,000 and have three funeral homes trying to make a living, trying to employ staff, trying to support a building, and spending money with the yellow pages trying to say the other one's an idiot. That that's just doesn't make sense. It, it's a waste of money. It's a waste of resources. But under capitalism, we have that opportunity to waste our money, time, and resources. But I will tell you that when you survive this with your health and with your finances in order because of less competition and the lessons you're going to learn. You're going to learn that cash is important. I cannot tell you how many funeral homes do not have enough cash to cover their overhead for one month, probably more than half. 
when the average business should be run to have two or three months of cash. Funeral homes are gonna to learn to collect receivables much better through this, because otherwise you're not gonna survive. <clears throat> so I do believe that if your body survives and if your mind survives, and if you allow necessity, necessity to be the mother of invention, I think Jessica was very close to having the uh, uh, the uh, silence button uh, when I paused after the word mother. But necessity is the mother of invention, and you are going to learn how to run your business better out of this. You're going to be stop being afraid of your competition. You know, I've seen, read probably 25 or 30 articles over the last two or three weeks, as I'm sure we all have. I've been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and other magazines. Not one article that's been published about funeral homes has in any way, shape, or form alleged that funeral directors are overpricing. The one person that has not been interviewed by any of these articles is Joshua Slocum. To me, th this represents that the caregiving qualities of the funeral home are being seized by the press right now and not the economics of someone having to pay for the death of a loved one. So funeral service right now is being shown in its true and proper light. Uh, now we just have to reform the business practices so someday you'll make as much money as Joshua Slocum thinks you do. <laughs> Dan, that's so true. I just I've seen article after article talking about the risks funeral directors are taking, the way that they are caring for their communities, and it's been a really nice change, I think, in the news cycle than what we normally see. So it's a really um, great point. I do have one more question before we close today. Um, Joe Prey says that he's interested in having you guys help him complete the application for the disaster relief loan. So who should he talk to about that? And if anybody here is interested in that, who should they talk to? Russell, or um, do you want us just to get have them get in touch with you? Yeah, Joe certainly has a client. You could send an email to, to me and Russ, and we, we'll take care of that. And we'll get cracking on that. And then for anybody else, if they're interested, they should just send, contact you. We'll send your information out when we um, send a follow-up of this recording. Yes, thank you. Okay. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we did record this. The handout is also going to be available, and we'll be sending that out to all of our OGR members. If you're interested in a roundtable discussion um, with other members on Friday, we'll be holding that this week at 3 p.m. Eastern. We're going to try the afternoon time. Um, that's a little less formal. People are on webcam, and you just kind of ask questions and see how other people in parts of the country and in Canada are uh, handling coronavirus in their area. So um, we thank you so much for joining us. Dan, thank you so much for taking the time out of your morning to do this. We appreciate it so much. And uh, we hope everybody has a good morning. Thank you. Thank you, guys.